Long before the game of golf came to America, it had been played for centuries along the windswept coast of Scotland. Golf was born on community lands, grass-covered sand dunes and treeless plains, open to everyone for grazing livestock or for recreation. By the late 1800s, British professionals were the masters of the sport. American golf was an amateur pastime then, a game enjoyed only by the wealthy on private estates or exclusive country clubs. The first formal golf course near Boston was a six-hole layout established in 1892 on the estate of Arthur Honeywell in the town of Wellesley. In 1893, Honeywell introduced the game to the members of his private country club in nearby Brookline, known simply as the Country Club. And golf became another activity there, joining croquet, archery, horse racing, and pony polo. By the turn of the century, golf was being played at more and more fashionable American clubs. With its popularity came the need to hire professional golfers, mostly from Scotland, to teach the game and to supervise its play. In 1908, American golf pioneer Alex Finlay returned to his hometown of Montrose to ask his friend Charlie Burgess to come to America. Charlie Burgess, or Che, as he was called by his family, was born in 1873 in Montrose, Scotland, where golf had been played for at least 300 years. One of nine children, he caddied as soon as he could carry clubs, becoming an excellent young golfer himself. Bob Dow, the Montrose professional and one of Scotland's grand old men of golf, saw that Charlie had a remarkable gift for the game and took him under his wing at an early age. Legendary golf pioneer old Tom Morris of nearby St. Andrews often traveled to Montrose for business and matches against his good friend Dow. Old Tom, regarded by many as the father of modern golf, became another important mentor to young Charlie. Charlie was extremely gifted in Scotland's other national sport, association football, known today as soccer. At age 15, he became the youngest player ever on the Montrose Football Club, and at age 20, began a professional career for Dundee, Millwall in London, Newcastle, and for the Portsmouth Football Club. At 29, he became the golf professional at the aristocratic Royal Albert Golf Club, and soon after was appointed superintendent of the Montrose Lynx, managing the common link shared by all the golf clubs of Montrose. Charlie played football for two more years, but devoted most of his time to golf, becoming a member of the world's first professional golfers association, established in Great Britain in 1901, a full 15 years before the PGA of America came into existence. By 1905, he had become an official in the Scottish section of the PGA, the Lynx champion of Montrose, and a competitor against the greatest golfers of his generation. But it was Burgess's reputation as a great teacher that gained him the most fame. It was said that he could have a beginner making respectable shots after only a few lessons. Although the promise of a career in the United States was appealing, Charlie was aware that teaching golf to American students would be challenging. In order for even the best American amateur golfers to be competitive with the Europeans, it will take nearly a generation for them to catch up. Many American students are completely unfamiliar with the sport and have often never even held a club in their hands before. Charlie was also concerned with the working conditions of American golf professionals and knew they had no voice in the management of the game they depended on for their livelihoods. The transplanted Scottish professionals and the handful of homebred pros were on their own, subject to the dictates of the club that hired them and of the United States Golf Association, the governing body of American golf an organization primarily concerned with the amateur game. Nonetheless, in early March of 1909, Charlie, his wife Harriet, 
and their 12-year-old son Charles II traveled by rail to the English port city of Liverpool to board the well-appointed steamship Ivernia, bound for America. The Woodland Golf Club was located on a grand Victorian estate once owned by Newton businessman William H. Monroe. The heart and soul of Charlie's Pro Shop at Woodland was his workbench and club making equipment. Metal stamps were used to emboss each club head with a clique mark, which identified the maker. Charlie's mark simply read, J. Burgess Special. Shortly after Charlie's arrival at Woodland, he was offered a very interesting position for the off-season. American college soccer was played between the late fall and early spring, which was a perfect complement to Charlie's golf schedule. Harvard University hired Burgess as the first professional coach of its struggling soccer team. It was also shortly after his arrival that Charlie discovered Francis Wiemet and his Brookline golf team practicing on the Woodland Links. It was my good fortune to meet Charlie soon after he became associated with the Woodland Golf Club in 1909. We had a golf team at Brookline High School, and Woodland generously allowed us to play many of our matches over their course. Francis impressed the experienced Scottish pro with his great potential and eagerness to learn. Charlie volunteered to give him private lessons every Sunday afternoon at Woodland. Francis had met the right man with the right skills and at the right time in his life to make him a champion. Working six days a week, Burgess had little time for himself. His Sundays were dedicated to his church and choir, then dinner at home with Hattie and young Charlie, and finally afternoon lessons for Francis. Although Francis had been playing at Woodland as Charlie's guest, he needed to be an actual member of the club in order to compete in official USGA events. The Woodland directors voted to establish a special junior membership for WeMet. His dues were $25 a year, $10 less than the regular fee. Francis went to his mother to obtain a loan for the money he needed. The next thing he did was to enter the 1910 United States Amateur Championship being held conveniently for Francis at the Country Club, right across the street from his home. Francis shot respectable opening rounds of 83 and 86 for a total that was just one stroke shy of qualifying for the tournament. It was an outstanding effort by the 17-year-old in his first encounter with golfers of national standing. Disappointed but determined, Francis continued his Sunday lessons with Charlie during the next two years, always striving to learn and to play better. Since 1909, the Harvard soccer team had also improved tremendously under Burgess. His innovations included teaching tactics and strategies to the previously untrained Harvard players. And to toughen up his college boys, he scheduled matches with local club and factory teams, teams of hardy immigrants who grew up playing soccer in their native lands. Charlie took the largely unrecognized, poorly coached, an underdeveloped soccer program at Harvard from obscurity to national prominence in just five years when Harvard won the Intercollegiate Championship of 1913. Francis won his first Massachusetts Amateur Championship and was eager to challenge for the National Amateur once again. Francis lost in the second round to the eventual champion Jerome Travers and although Francis was eliminated early, USGA President Robert Watson was greatly impressed. Watson decided to enter Francis into the United States Open, being held just two weeks later at, of all places, the country club in Brookline. It was a lucky twist of fate. The Open, normally held in June, was postponed until September in order to accommodate the schedules of British Open champions Harry Varden and Edward Ted Ray who were touring America that summer. Francis Wiemet, a virtual unknown, looked more like a caddy than a contender. The only person looking more out of place was little Eddie Lowry, Wiemet's 10-year-old caddy from Woodland. 
who was not much taller than the canvas golf bag he carried for Francis. Harry Varden and Ted Ray finished the national championship with scores of 304 each, setting the stage for a head-to-head -head playoff between golf's biggest stars. As they retired to their quarters to post their official scores, Francis was still out on the course and had just holed a 30-foot putt for a three on the 13th green. We met Mate Parr in the next three holes, the crowd around him growing increasingly hopeful. In order to tie Varden and Ray for the championship, Francis needed to shoot one under par for the final two holes. Francis drove off on the final hole with the gusto that showed his heart, nerve, and ability were all behind it. It was an amazing show of determination for Francis under almost impossible circumstances. It had been raining well over 30 hours when Varden, Ray, and Wemet teed off for America's championship. No player had more than a one-stroke lead at any given time. And at the end of the first nine, the match remained deadlocked. At the short 140-yard 10th hole, Francis took the lead by one, when Varden and Ray both missed their putts for bogeys while Francis got his par. After 12 holes, it was Varden 51, Ray 51, and we met 49. The two Englishmen began to show signs of anxiety. The final score was we met 72, Varden 77, and Ray 78. Spontaneous shouts of joy rang out. Reporters rushed to their wires to spread the news around the world. We met's amazing victory was not only the greatest upset in the history of golf, it was the greatest upset in the history of American sports. Francis Wiemet changed the face of golf that September day in 1913 and became America's first golf hero. After Wiemet's historic victory, Woodland voted him a member for life, exempt from all dues. Wiemet became an ambassador of American golf in 1914, winning the French Amateur Championship and competing in both the British Amateur and Open tournaments. Charlie Burgess coached Harvard to a second national soccer championship in 1914. That back-to-back -back achievement has never been repeated. One year after his victory in Brookline, Wiemet fulfilled his boyhood dream by winning the United States Amateur Championship at the Aquatic Golf Club in Manchester, Vermont. He became the first man ever to win back-to-back -back U.S. Open and national amateur titles. In 1921, the embryonic PGA of America offered few benefits and little support to the thousands of club and teaching pro members. As a remedy, Charlie Burgess founded the independent New England Professional Golfers Organization to improve the working conditions of club and teaching pros. The New England PGO became the first professional golfers organization in the country to sponsor official co-ed events pairing with the Women's Golf Association of Boston, showcasing budding female stars like Elizabeth Gordon and Glenna Collette. The actions of the New England PGO forced the PGA to restructure in 1922, and when it did, New England rejoined the PGA, unanimously electing Charlie Burgess as the first president of the new New England PGA. Jesse Guilford became the second national champion coached by Charlie Burgess, winning the 1921 United States Amateur in St. Louis. Both Jesse and Francis were chosen as members of the first Walker Cup team. Jesse played on three more teams, while Francis played on seven and was non-playing captain four times. During golf's golden age, Woodland prospered building a new clubhouse and gaining scores of new members. Charlie Burgess was a mentor to dozens of other professionals and was a sought after instructor to amateur golfers from the worlds of politics, entertainment, and sports. After the first Ryder Cup match in 1927, the financially struggling PGA could not afford to send a team to England for the 1929 rematch. Charlie Burgess organized an unprecedented fundraising extravaganza for the PGA, 
gathering America's greatest stars. 1928 U.S. Open champion Johnny Farrell, amateur sensation Bobby Jones, and celebrity professionals Walter Hagen and Gene Sarazen for an extraordinary best ball match at Woodland. Burgess presided as Grand Marshal, and Francis Wiemet served as referee. The collaboration of Wiemet and Jones sent a strong message that the great divide between amateur and professional golf should finally come to an end. $10,000 was raised in a single day, and the Ryder Cup was saved from extinction. On April 6, 1929, the Woodland members gave Charlie Burgess a testimonial to celebrate his 20 years with the club and his influence on the growing respect between amateur and professional golfers. It was the first time in the history of professional golf in this country that a member of the profession has been so notably honored by the amateur members of a club. W.A. Whitcomb, reporting for the Boston Globe. Burgess was presented with a tribute of $120 gold coins. However, it was the words of Francis we met that night that meant even more to him than gold. Whatever progress I have made in golf, I owe directly to Charlie Burgess. He always had the faculty of putting me in a proper frame of mind when entering an important match. And I repeat, he taught me whatever I know about the game. Francis we met, April 6th, 1929. We met recaptured the National Amateur at the Beverly Country Club in Chicago in September of 1931, 17 years after his victory in Vermont, and credited his success to his mentor once again. I don't know what I would have done out there without Charlie Burgess. He was a great strong bulwark to lean on at all times. When things were going a little tough, you will never know what his encouragement meant to me. Francis We met, Chicago, September 5th, 1931. Charlie Burgess remained at Woodland for nearly 40 years, renewing his contract from year to year simply with a handshake. During the difficult years of the Great Depression and World War II, Burgess mentored still another great young golfer, Stanley Ted Bishop, who captured the 1946 Massachusetts, New England, and United States Amateur Championships. He was Charlie's third national champion. Jay Burgess is enshrined in the New England PGA Hall of Fame for his many contributions to the game of golf. But perhaps his greatest contribution was the estimated 15,000 lessons he gave to everyday golfers during his long career. Francis Wiemet became the first American elected captain of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club in St. Andrews, Scotland, and is an original member of the World Golf Hall of Fame. Through his dedication, practice, and perseverance, Francis Wiemet inspired countless others while making his dream come true.